On the day of the Boston Marathon bombing in 2013, Rebecca Gregory could never have imagined how her life would change in just an instant. Now, four years later, she has fought her way back to life, and she's here today to tell us her story. Rebecca, we're going to continue on with this story. You uh, ended up having a very public marriage. Your boyfriend at the time was new. He yes. was injured as well. And so when he proposed to you, it became a big, beautiful media thing that probably everyone watched, and it seemed like the fairy tale ending, in a sense. But it, it wasn't. It was, yeah. Everyone wanted it to be so much more than it was, and I wanted it to be so much more. But when you have things, you go through things like that, you realize who's there for you and who's not. And you also realize that your plans are not necessarily God's plans. And so I was following my own path, trying to get through life kind of on my own, and that's when I realized, hey, this is not good. And just like my leg, I had to let that part go, and it was so humiliating and embarrassing because it was so public. But as soon as I did that, God really opened up so many doors for me, and He showed me that, that that's what I needed to do all along. I so feel for you because, you know, you spent a year and a half fighting to save your leg, finally made the, the tough decision to amputate. Two days later, you find out that He's been cheating on you, by something you get in the mail. And there you are, single mom now again. Um, you're dealing with the amputation and all of that recovery and the trauma of the bombing and now a divorce and the public publicity of that. And of course, people are not always so kind on the <laughs> internet to you. How, how did you get through those days? That letter really saved my life. Whoever wrote it, I will be forever indebted to them. But I remember going to a therapist office and sitting down with a lady and saying, what am I doing wrong? What is going on that I keep attracting people like this? And it stemmed back from my childhood where I had an abusive father growing up who was an evangelist who traveled all over the world preaching, was said to be the next Billy Graham, and he came home and abused me and my mom. And so from a young age, I was told I wasn't good enough enough. And that was kind of the message that I carried throughout my life. And I had no idea the impact that it would make on me in my relationships as an adult. But once again, God just brought me through that. And I'm in such a beautiful chapter now. And his plans are so much greater than ours. You reconnected with a wonderful man after this that you had known in university and you had to move away. So yes. it, you never really finished that relationship and you fell in love. It was my old college boyfriend of all things. I was 18 <laughs> years old and I had to move away because my sister had heart surgery and I needed to move back home to be with her. And we had not seen each other in 10 years and over a dinner that he had been to because he was out of town. He was on a business trip in Houston from Kentucky. Kentucky. We met up because that's where I live and through Facebook of all things I said hey we should get dinner while you're here and it was like that week we realized that nothing had changed between us only that we were older and more mature and we had lived and we got married on a beach in Jamaica five months later. Oh, I love it. There's so much more to your story. You wrote your book Taking My Life Back and people are going to have to read it because there's no possible way we can cover everything <laughs> in this interview. But, you know, I wanted to ask you about your relationship with God because, you know, it wasn't always easy. And I think when people suffer, they just see that like you, you proclaim faith and it's very real to you and, and, and it's real to you now. But there were some dark moments. How did you work through all of that and find God in the midst of this? There are still dark moments. And I think that everyone's life is a mess. Whether or not we tell people about it is a different story. But one of the reasons that I wrote my book, the reason I wrote it, is just to say, this is my story, this is me, and life has not been easy. It has been very difficult. But these are just my obstacles, and mine aren't any greater than anyone else's. And everyone has life blow up in their face, whether it's a literal bomb or just a figurative one. And so by me exposing my toughest struggles and and showing the places where God wasn't necessarily I thought was prevalent when he really was. He was trying so hard to show me and I was just backing away because of my childhood and all of the things that I witnessed from that. Now, it's important because when you look at my story, there's so many different miracles and there's so many times where I shouldn't have made it through. Six months before Boston even, I was held up in a Walmart parking lot and robbed at gunpoint. So there's been so many different times, but God is still so much more powerful than all of it. And I think it's so great that you share about your dad because I think a lot of people have problems with God because of what people have done. Yeah. People who represent him that we don't always represent him well. We're running out of time. Ah. <laughs> so, but I want to get to the bomber. So the FBI asked you to testify in court against him. And so tell me about seeing him for the first time and, and having to tell your story right in front of him, like feet away from him. 
A week after my amputation, the FBI comes into my hospital room and says, oh, by the way, you've got to testify in the trial of the remaining bomber. And so life is never boring, right? And I didn't want to do it at the time, but it was something that I'm so glad that I did do because it was closing a chapter of my life. And when I was in the courtroom, I didn't want him to gain any more satisfaction based on what he had done. And so I gave my testimony, but the coolest part was that I was also asked to give a victim impact statement. And I got to go back and I looked at him right in the eye and I stood stronger than I've ever stood before and that was all God because that was definitely not me and I said in order to give a victim impact statement today I'd have to be someone's victim and I'm definitely not yours and I'm definitely not your brothers and I went on to say that there are that many more people ready to do the work in getting rid of evil once and for all and I'm one of them and this is just my small way of making a difference and I feel like God's given me an incredible platform in order to do that and I feel so blessed every day of my life. That's crazy for you to say you've suffered so much that I feel so blessed. Only God can do that. I think um, people need to get your book and find out the whole story of how you got from there to here. Thanks for coming to share your story today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been so fun. It's been awesome. And we do need to keep praying for Rebecca as she shares this story across the nation with her book tour. You know, for a lot of people who've been through traumatic events, it can re-traumatize people to share it. So please remember Rebecca in your prayers. And if you're watching this and you're in that dark place and God doesn't feel near you at all, why don't you remember one of my favorite sayings is that today is not your forever. Where you are today doesn't have to be where you end up. When Rebecca was laying on the ground and her bones were beside her, she could not imagine today, married to a wonderful man, two beautiful kids, and on a journey of healing. Hang in there. Give our prayer lines a call, 1-866-273-4444. We'd love to pray with you and encourage you and let you know you're not alone. We'll be right back.